So that was Latin American literature? Perhaps. At the outset of this course, my minimal promise was that we would be engaging with a series of interesting and challenging texts, and our first aim was to figure out strategies to read them well, and expand our horizons through this exploration of new texts, new readings. I'm happy enough that we've accomplished this, and you should be too. You may never in your life read another Mexican, Chilean, Brazilian, or Guatemalan author, but you now have some clues as to how to tackle them, if you do. Some of the books we have read have been difficult, but I hope that difficulty will no longer put you off. I'm not sure what your initial expectations were for this course, or for the text that we have read. You may want to refresh your memory as to what you wrote down in answer to my question in the opening lecture. But those expectations may well have changed. And I hope that you now expect more of yourself, too. Moreover, you have concepts, play, performance, translation, dialogism, entrapment, affect and the trace, but also many, many others, that you can put to use in further expanding your horizons in whatever direction you choose. In some ways, we've only skimmed surfaces, but we've also learned, for example in reading La Mabelle, to defend superficiality when necessary. What you do with all this is up to you. Our second aim was to trace patterns of commonality and difference between the texts that we read. We could think about patterns of either form or content. There have been, for example, a plethora of first-person narrators, of texts presented as memoir or recollection. What are the effects of that narrative style, and how has it been deployed, perhaps to different ends? As for themes, we've read many books about history, violence, politics, fate, family, gender, madness, rationality, the real. But you may have been drawn to other recurring topics, reflecting your own interests and concerns. Resistance, disease, technology, food and drink. Pause the video and think back. What patterns have you seen? Could you group the texts according to their different approaches or obsessions? What common problems do they identify? What common blind spots do they exhibit? Do they constitute a tradition of any sort? Or is every text we have read truly singular, absolutely distinct? Write down some thoughts. While you do that, I'll have a Negroni Spagliato, but I'll be right back. One theme that has pervaded almost all these texts from the outset has been time and temporality in all its various manifestations. We began, after all, with a text, Teresa de la Parra's Mama Blanca's Memoirs, that presents itself as a memoir, albeit edited and updated, for the fashion of a contemporary age. The tale it tells skips back to its narrator's semi-mythic childhood, an apparently golden age interrupted all too soon by the coming of modernity and exile from rustic childhood play to a city education that is all about improvement and getting on. The past here helps to constitute what Dutch cultural historian Johan Wiesinger might call a magic circle in which different rules apply. 
de la Parra's story is in part about how the boundaries of that magic circle are breached as time passes, though its bounds were always precarious at best. Encircling a sugar plantation whose produce was presumably bound for international export. In the end, all such circles are connected. Similarly, the past contains the seeds of the present, and part of the point of the novel's publication is surely that we might learn from it still. Likewise, in other stories we have read that feature in different ways, interrupted pasts, from Nelly Campobello's Catuccio to Gabriel Garcia Marquez's One Hundred Years of Solitude, Roberto Bolaño's Distant Star, to Rita Indiana's Papi. There are always threads that connect past to present. And often, history seems to catch up with us sooner rather than later. Indeed, in some cases, as perhaps for the Buendia family and the village of Macondo in Garcia Marquez's epic. Arguably, the problem may be that we cannot escape our past, cannot put enough distance between then and now. Another theme, indeed, might be modernization and its discontents. In very few of the books we have read, is modernity an unalloyed good, and it provokes responses that range from nostalgia and grief in, say, Mama Blanca's memoirs and Cartuccio, to a disconcerting sense of uncanny fear and anxiety in Cristina Rivera Garza's The Tiger Syndrome or Samantha Schwebelin's Fever Dream. Putatively modernizing projects are disastrous if not genocidal, in texts such as One Hundred Years of Solitude or Rigoberto Menchu's I, Rigoberto Menchu. Mario Vargas Llosa can at least laugh at the madness of bureaucratic rationality in Captain Pentoja and the Special Service, though as we have seen, we may hesitate to join in with that laughter. In Alejo Carpentier's The Kingdom of This World, the liberating potential of the Enlightenment is briefly welcomed, albeit with a recognition of its hypocrisies and failures. But ultimately, the promise of progress is cruelly denied. It is perhaps only in Rita Indiana's Papi, as well as in the madness of a character such as Garcia Marquez's José Arcadio Buendía, that modernization is ever fully embraced. And even here, consumer capitalism devolves into, at best, a crude cargo cult, at worst, a kind of pyramid scheme sustained by faith alone. Giannina Braschi's Yo-Yo Boing may be the most optimistic text we have read, with its querulous multitude of characters waiting for something to happen, waiting for Kairos, the right time, which will come when nobody expects it. As Marxist theorist Louis Althusser puts it, history in this conception is not so much the foregone conclusion that most theories of modernization and development suggest, a more a matter of circumstance and chance. The encounter may not take place, just as it may take place. Nothing determines, no principle of decision determines this alternative in advance. It is on the order of a game of dice. A throw of the dice will never abolish chance. Indeed, a successful encounter, one that is not brief, but lasts, never guarantees that it will continue to last tomorrow, rather than come undone. Rather than complacency about the future, then, many of the texts that we have read advocate learning to appreciate and take advantage of fleeting moments of possibility, and preparing ourselves for the certainty that everything will soon change, 
though we know not when or how. Pedro Lamabel's My Tender Matador, for instance, imagines the brief, unlikely encounter between Loca and activist, a precarious magic circle that enables a fleeting but life-changing love affair. Here the gambles the couple take do not quite come off. But looking back at the past, here and in many of the other texts, reminds us that things might have been different, and encourages us to roll the dice again, to replay history in the hopes of a different outcome. Even the most fearsome of dictatorships have their vulnerable side, their moments of panic, the points at which they have to confront the fictiveness of hegemony. From Jorge Luis Borges's Labyrinths and Juan Rufo's Pedro Paramo to Distant Star, Captain Pentoja to Ay Rigoberto Menchu, these texts mock the pretensions of constituted power and its ambitions to determine the shape of the future. Is there something specifically Latin American about this view of history? There is no doubt that the region offers a privileged, but also traumatically violent, perspective on the traps and false promises of so-called development, on what critic Walter Mignolo terms the darker side of Western modernity. From the very outset of the colonial period, and still in the present, global economic development has depended upon the often rapacious extraction of raw materials from a landscape shaped according to Western desires. To export sugar from the Caribbean, bananas from Colombia, cotton and coffee from Guatemala, soy from Argentina, and so on. In feverish cycles of boom and bust that leave behind little but death and destruction and ruins of passing splendor. Not that any of these texts buy into the latest utopian project, popularized by Mignolo and others, of some kind of impossible decolonization. After all, they are often keen to explore the possibilities enabled by modern, even modernist, forms of aesthetic and cultural production, not least the institution of literature itself. Writers such as Borges and Garcia Marquez even show that they can teach the Europeans a thing or two when it comes to modernity's rich capacities for contradiction and self-critique. The point is not to deny or roll back the past, but to look instead for spaces or moments where there are some chances for life and freedom, some room to play. Latin America has seen many false dawns, periods in which it seemed change was coming, only for these hopes and expectations to be cruelly curtailed. Again, Latin American fiction is often drawn to such episodes, to recapture and replay them differently. None of this quite constitutes a tradition. Not that there are not traditions or lineages crisscrossing the region's literary production but they neither define nor exhaust it. If, however, there is a characteristic common to much Latin American literature, it is perhaps a certain relationship to tradition, or to the multiple historical and cultural traditions that claim to circumscribe it. A skepticism or irreverence, an impulse to stop the past, only to set it in motion again, a disposition to see history not as linear, but as a field of potential and still untapped possibility to which we might still return. I suggested at the outset of this course that we should give up in advance on the quest for any single style, theme or motif 
that would identify or characterize Latin American literature. The image I proposed instead for what we would be doing was hopscotch, a children's game that can be played almost anywhere on many different surfaces, from sand to earth, tarmac to linoleum. Out and back, out and back, in a series of readings outlined over the past 12 weeks, I tried where possible to invoke the ludic dimension in the text we have covered. From the games of innocence and irony in Mama Blanca's memoirs, to the war games of Mariano Asuela's The Underdogs, through to the role play in My Tender Matador, and the end of the game in Fever Dream. But the point was not simply to jump to the passages where these texts directly, however fleetingly, thematize sport or play, but rather to approach them in the spirit of a game, to take advantage of the play, the freedom, opportunity, or room for action, scope for activity, that literature offers once we realize that there is no one right way of reading. Many of the authors we have read, in what has been effectively a survey of the Latin American canon, have been sanctified and crowned with either official acclamation, awards and prizes, or popular affection. But we have not been afraid, I hope, to read against the grain. For instance, with a figure such as Nobel Prize winner and sometime popular favourite Pablo Neruda. Or alternatively, to find new ways to read a so-called tarnished laureate such as Rigoberta Menchu. To play with something is also to defer judgment, just as to toy with something, a meal, an idea, is to postpone final consumption or decision, to look at it from all sides, without necessarily committing to any one perspective. Critical analysis is neither a popularity contest nor an attempt to somehow one-up the text by means of a stroke of devastating insight. It is simply a matter of taking time with the words on the page until perhaps they shimmer or move as if of their own accord, to show their fractures and rifts, the cracks through which, as Canadian singer Leonard Cohen puts it, the light gets in. If anything, it is the mistakes, the missteps, the tensions and contradictions that can be most interesting in any reading. As Erin Graf Zivin puts it, errors, blind spots and misunderstandings can comprise the most potent aspects of literary texts. Similarly, misreading is not opposed to reading, but rather resides at the heart of the act of reading. When we read, we cannot help but err in the sense of deviating, straying, diverging from some set path. After all, as Borges suggests in Pierre Menard, even the most faithful recreation and repetition of a text will always introduce differences to greater or lesser effect. And it is in these deviations or swerves that novelty and creation arise. Critic Harold Bloom claims that the history of poetic influence always proceeds by a misreading of the prior poet, an act of creative correction that is actually and necessarily a misinterpretation. We might equally point out that the good player of a game often surprises his or her opponent, sometimes even surprises themselves, with an unpredictable swerve or spin, 
a deviation, however so slight, that opens up space on the board or court. This is far from saying that anything goes. Not all divergences or errors are equally interesting or productive. Some misreadings are strong in Bloom's terms, and others are less so. But the test of a reading is less its fidelity to the past, whether that be whatever we imagine the author may have intended, or some recreation of historical context, than the extent to which it charts a new course for the future. British novelist Stuart Holmes' 69 Things to Do with a Dead Princess is, among other things, about the fanatical reader of a book that is also called 69 Things to Do with a Dead Princess, whose author claims to have taken the dead body of Princess Diana around a circuit of the prehistoric ruined sites of Aberdeenshire. In homage to this bizarre account, the protagonists of Holmes' book haul a ventriloquist dummy named Dudley to the same Neolithic barrows, stone circles, and Iron Age hill forts of northeastern Scotland. That is one way to respond to a text. Holmes' novel ends with an ellipsis, to suggest, among other things, that this reading far from exhausts its source. Living out the death of these fantasies in blasted and blistered night, we were consumed by the turning of a page. I like to think of the field of Latin American literary criticism as something of a dead princess, a body of work once much more animate and animated than it is today, which we cannot simply abandon to its fate. Rather, as with the ventriloquist dummy, we can give it new life and make it speak in new ways as we take it on a tour of unfamiliar sights, other pasts, and other potential futures. Ruins make great playgrounds. On an artificial island, what was once the great lake Xochimilco, not far from the former seat of the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, now a suburb of Mexico City, is a similarly grotesque sight that comes with its own rather gruesome and perhaps doubtful narrative. A colony of old, once discarded dolls, many missing eyes or limbs, or otherwise misshapen and damaged, hanging from trees and tumble-down buildings. The modern legend of this Island of the Dolls involves a drowned girl and a somewhat obsessed caretaker of the island, Julian Santana Barrera, who over the course of fifty years living there strung up these dolls to placate the girl's spirit, which in turn allegedly inhabits the deformed figurines. The place is now a tourist attraction, and also, Mexican magazine Reforma tells us, inspiration to the likes of Hollywood director Tim Burton. Play and performance, spectacle and compulsion, superstition and canny marketing mix in this drive to reshape the physical environment by recycling and reusing objects otherwise seen as no longer fit for use. Moreover, we see here that playfulness and the grotesque can, and often do, go hand in hand, as it is hard to judge the level of seriousness with which we should, we should take the installation. Is the joke on us, the bemused tourist, prone to seek out the exotic and the macabre, the real marvellous, in Latin American folk culture. Lake Xochimilco 
is also the last remaining natural habitat for the critically endangered salamander, the axolotl. Its name, in fact, comes from Nahuatl, atol, water, and solotl, doll, toy, mythical personality. It is a water doll, a water toy, or perhaps some kind of supernatural being. Indeed, the axolotl is a creature famous for its prodigious healing abilities, its capacity to regenerate limbs, tail, and even gills and eyes, and parts of its brain, if they should be damaged and require repair. This is partly because, unusually for amphibians, axolotls do not metamorphose into an adult state. They remain effectively larvae, perpetually immature. With lidless eyes and broad, apparently smiling mouth, an axolotl can appear to be staring at us, quietly confident of something that it knows that we do not. This odd relationship between human and axolotl is the premise of hopscotch author Julio Cortázar's short story, Axolotl, in which a man comes daily to a Parisian aquarium to stare at these creatures, pressing his face up against the glass of their tank. He's fascinated by the gaze that they return to him. The eyes of the axolotl spoke to me of the presence of a different life, of another way of seeing. Perhaps their eyes could see in the dead of night, and for them the day continued indefinitely. He keeps returning, until one day he finds himself trapped in the tank, looking outwards. He is now an axolotl, but he can also see himself staring in. I saw my face against the glass. I saw it on the other side of the glass. Then my face drew back and understood. Outside, my face came close to the glass again. I saw my mouth, the lips compressed with the effort of understanding the axolotls. I was an axolotl, and now I knew instantly that no understanding was possible. As critic Brett Levinson comments, the narrator's plight is a metaphor, both for the anthropological gaze and for the destiny of Latin America, condemned always to be other, even to itself. Cortázar's Latin American, in other words, is an axolotl, a being forced to dwell as a prisoner inside alienating Western structures and discourses. Structures and discourses that this person must nonetheless use if he or she is to live or speak at all. But the story also clearly plays out the plot of writing or literature, as at its conclusion the narrator slash axolotl imagines himself, the narrator slash man, to be the potential author of the story that we ourselves are reading. I console myself by thinking that perhaps he's going to write a story about us, that, believing he's making up a story, he's going to write all this about axolotls. Literary fiction may not ultimately tell us much about axolotls. They remain beyond understanding, uncannily seductive and captivating, storehouses or screens for our own projected desires and fantasies. But by imagining ourselves axolotl, larval subjects looking from the outside in or inside out, we may gain new perspective on the strangeness that is genuinely ours. At its best, then, literature constructs for us scenarios and spaces in which, at least for a time, other habits and customs are in play, and which thus allow us to see that the rules of the everyday games that we play are as arbitrary as any others. 
This is not to say that those rules can simply be changed at will. Any game is embedded in an entire infrastructure that penalizes infringement of its codes of behavior and rewards those who choose to forget or are oblivious of the fact that they are playing a game. But who knows? As Borges reminds us, it may take only the most imperceptible of variations, the smallest of swerves, to transform everything and inaugurate an entirely new field of play.